Cortez. All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Jade Herman. I am the Director of Planning and Events in the Office of the President at the School of Mines, and I'd like to welcome you to our STEAM Cafe event. Um, thank you to everyone for coming and those of you who are joining us virtually. Our STEAM Cafe is a partnership between South Dakota Mines, the South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and Hay Camp Brewing, and we have been putting these events on since April of 2018. Um, so we're very thankful for your continued support and for our partnerships. Um, these events also happen the third Tuesday of every month. Um, so this month's talk is Seeking the Unseen and Many Other Things, Why an Artist Went a Mile Underground, presented by Gina Gibson, Professor of Graphic Design at Black Hill State University and Coordinator of the Sanford Underground Research Facilities Artist in Residence Program. So welcome, Gina. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I've come to these events, the STEAM Cafe events, and I was really excited to get the invite. So thank you, School of Mines. Um, so my name is Gina Gibson, and I'm a professor. I'm an artist. I'm a graphic designer. I collect objects and ideas, which you're going to see very clearly soon. I am a karaoke enthusiast, which came in handy when I was at the Sanford Lab. And I'm a dog mom, and much is to be determined, so as for most of us. has to make sure the slides move forward. There we go. So when people think about art and they think about science, they usually think about things like illustration, specifically scientific illustration or medical illustration. They may think of infographics. But there's often a gap. People don't know that fine artists are interested in going to these places, such as Fermi Labs, CERN, um, Nokia Bell Labs, to not only interact, but get inspired. So what would someone be inspired by? Well, the big question is, why would somebody do this anyway, right? What, what would be inspiring? Why would you do it? And the simplest answer I can come up with is the same one that many scientists come up with, engineers, it is the idea of curiosity. Now, I'll give you a little background on my artwork so that it's clearer why I might be attracted to the things or drawn to the things that I was while I was at Sanford Lab. I have a history of working with symbols, such as doors, chairs, ladders, and that continues on in multiple bodies of work that I've produced. So whether it was a graphic, such as the ones you just saw, or found objects, like what I'm showing you now, the chair, windows, broken rocks, things that are broken interest me. And I'm always looking, whether I'm out hiking, or if I'm out in a city, I might be looking at architecture. So a trip to Japan, and I'm fascinated by the way architecture works, the buildings, the roofs look different passageways that interest me. And sometimes it moves completely in abstraction. So sometimes it's more literal or figurative, and other times it's very abstract. And I'm attracted to both, so I do both in my work. So how did I go from outside to underground? That's, I get asked this quite often. And initially, I was invited. So in 2013, I was a part of a group art show that the Sanford Lab used um, the opportunity to invite artists, about 20 South Dakota artists. And we went underground and we interacted with physicists and engineers, and we had to talk about dark matter as a theme. And the piece I produced, because we were only asked to do one piece, it was a traveling exhibition. The piece I produced was really about the search. So I thought about a bullseye, and I was really interested in the electrical equipment and water, and it just was fascinating. So I was combining multiple ideas. And I combined things like my symbol set with some of those images like you just saw of like literal physical things. So what is an artist in residence? It's to reside or be situated. I didn't get to live a mile underground for a year. Too bad, right? Um, but I had to have some training and education about a culture and a place. 
which included learning things like PPE, which now we're all way more aware of what PPE is than I was when I first went to the Sanford lab a year and a half ago or so. And then a PMT, what's a photomultiplier tube? And some of the School of Mines folks might be like, yeah, I know about that, but I have art school training. So I didn't know about that. So I was fascinated the first time somebody handed me a photomultiplier tube. I'm like, what, what is this thing? What does it do? How does it work? And then things like simple phrases, like people would say, is that on the tap? And I'm like, what's the tap? So it's the trip action plan. There were all kinds of other terms that I needed to learn about. I also had to get an eye exam and my eye doctor was quite amused that I said, can I please have pictures of my eyeballs? I might use them in my artwork. So I've at least used them in a uh, PowerPoint presentation. And I had to go through this routine that almost everyone that would be going to the Sanford lab on a regular basis would go through. You have a badge, you have brass tags, one is in your pocket and one is on the board when you go underground. And for everyone that gets to ride on the cage and go a mile underground, it's an experience unlike any other. It's wet and interesting and kind of um, sensory overload in a way that I personally enjoy. And I'm not a thrill ride person, so that's not what it was. It was more of a potential of what we would see and what would happen and what was being done underground. But I knew very little. As you know, I was amazed by the photo multiplier too. So I had to read, and I started with something as simple as the ABCs of particle physics. We had to go way, way, way back. So I started with relatively simple books, uh, tried to move into some broader ideas, found some graphic novels along the way, which I have an interest in as well. So Feynman and Hawking graphic novels are quite good. I was also looking at the stars, maps, things that were historical. In addition to that, I was interested in this place being the Black Hills, the history of the hills, the connection to the Native American community, even the geology. And when we look at the Sanford lab, we might see two things that are very interesting to us. These are called head frames, and they're from the Homestake days. So these are iconic, and I ended up using them quite a bit in my, my artwork. And I'm interested in the old, as you know, because I've mentioned discarded things interest me. I like going to thrift stores and finding random things that may or may not become artwork or decor. But when I was at the lab, I was interested in, well, what is that thing? So a building right before it was uh, being torn down to make way for something new, uh, I got to wander around a little bit and I found interesting things to me, particularly with this one, the color. So sometimes I'm grabbed by just color. I was interested in these passageways, staircases. There's a door, which you know I'm looking for because I've, you've seen that in my previous work. I found just the walls and tunnels underground fascinating. So it sounds different. I don't know how to describe it. it just sounds different. The light's different. So it was just this space that I sort of had this, wow, what is happening? What am I experiencing? And my eyes also had to take in so much every trip. It was just like, I was overly excited to take photos. Where the wall just sort of stops being painted because they didn't need to paint it any higher. Bolted in to protect us from having a rock fall. Or maybe where a wall just completely ends completely, which I really enjoyed. The ground was interesting. So that's like Epsom salt. I jokingly said I could take it home for a bath. I don't think I'd want to. Footprints that were there long before I was. And then my first times getting in clean room garb, and some of you probably have done that. Um, so I was not used to how long it takes to get into a clean room suit. It takes a very long time an opportunity to see copper, which I find quite beautiful. So you'll find that I've used copper and gold and other, um, and s silver in some of the later artwork. I kept seeing circles and that showed up. Um, so I had an opportunity to interact with the Lux Zeppelin or the LZ experiment. And there's this like little hole that you could kind of go through. I don't believe you can any longer. 
um, but they were in the middle of installation. And I found it interesting because I was finding a ladder that I found attractive because I'm looking for those things. So the, your attention, how many of you bought a car and suddenly you see that car everywhere, right? You never notice that car, but then you buy a car and you see it. Well, my attention is drawn to things because they're already there. So the ladders and the chairs, the ladder again, I got overly excited. There's a ladder and a chair together. So I was beside myself. I'm sure the person that was my guide, I think it was Matt Kappas that day, probably thought, okay, she's very enthusiastic about this. Chair. I had to, I have to leave this in this PowerPoint because there was art underground and I wanna pay respect to the previous artist. Um, there were a few people that joked with me while I'm at, I was at Sanford Lab that would say, wait, I'm the artist. And you know, some of these folks were there since homestake or at least returned after homestake. So it was quite fun and playful. I felt very welcome. Doorways. And I'm very attracted to color, like I mentioned. So this blue and this orange. And I was also attracted to reflections. And this is something I find interesting, whether I'm looking over water or if I'm looking in a mirror, distortion interests me. So I found this particularly interesting and I'll take my time with the artwork and talk to you about how some of these come back in the artwork. There's a photo multiplier tube array. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I'm sure some of my physicist friends will make it clear if I said it wrong, uh, which I appreciate. Um, so the Lux Zeppelin experiment, this is a, a view of the array. I felt very privileged to be able to see it. I also took a flatbed scanner underground, which was quite a feat um, because I couldn't take some items out from underground, right? So they said, well, you can scan them or photograph them, but you can't take it above ground, okay? So I took my own equipment underground uh, by permission, of course. And this gave me an opportunity to scan items like copper rings. There were some silver rings. Um, I ended up uh, taking photographs of numerous rocks. I think I have a very large photographic rock collection at this point. Maybe not the rock collection everyone would want, like, but the photographic rock collection. One of the physicists was kind enough to give me a bucket of cable slices, which I was beyond thrilled with. I was actually chatting with him. So here, let's talk about an exchange of art. He said, well, what are you finding interesting? I said, well, there's all these circles. I was scanning the copper rings that day. He was sitting a few seats down. He said, well, have you ever seen like, you know, the inside of a, a cable? And I was like, no, I haven't seen the inside of a cable. What does the inside of a cable look like? And he said, well, it looks kind of like what you're doing. So these became quite an inspiring uh, bucket of things. And um, I just thought how interesting that the exchange was. I'm sitting there casually having a conversation doing what I do as an artist and he cared enough to ask. And then one of my favorite things underground, I ran into one of my colleagues at Black Hill State University, Dr. David Bergman. So he was researching and is researching bacteria so I was underground maybe the first day and I was waiting at what, what is called the X and I look to my right and there is one of my colleagues who didn't know I was there. And he said, Gina? And I said, hey, how are you? And he said, well, I'm collecting bacteria. And I said, it's with you? He's like, yeah, it's right here. And he points to his bag and I said, is that okay? Um, so, and this is post COVID. So, you know, it, it was just a kind of a lighthearted exchange. And I said, well, what does bacteria look like at the 4850 level? 4850 level being a mile underground approximately. And he said, well, why don't you come to the lab? So I had a day hanging out with bacteria, which was a delightful day. And there were consecutive days. I was surprised at the variety of bacteria. Sometimes it looks like spaghetti, which you'll see in future artwork. So bacteria, I wasn't interested in showing you what bacteria looks like literally. As an artist, I was interested in what I could do with the bacteria to make something, well, beautiful to me. So 
There are times I make art or design work with the intention of making it for the audience. And there are other times where I'm just exploring something because I'm engaged in it, because it seems like an interesting endeavor. And I have found, in my experience, if the individual artist cares enough about their work, other people, even if they've never cared about what bacteria looks like in their life, will suddenly care too. It's our enthusiasm that tends to, well, light a fire. So when we're excited about something, we can share it. So I got very excited about bacteria. And I became interested in what would happen if I divided the spaces, if I changed the colors, if I manipulated what happened. As you can maybe remember from my earlier work, I'm interested in mirroring of images. Bacteria that was noisy. So I kept thinking about cosmic noise, all these things I was reading about in these physics books, which seemed very abstract to me, which seemed very visual in some ways. So it's like, well, how do I represent that abstraction? How do I represent noise? How do I represent webbing? Again, an interesting color might draw me to push a design in a certain direction. So these are little blue booties that you might have noticed in my, one of my photos. So I took those blue booties, which I liked the texture of, and then I pushed the colors toward that blue and orange. And you'll see I use the blue and orange a couple of times in a few pieces. And you might remember that reflected material. So I took that reflected material these are not the colors that it originally was. And I have multiple versions of this. I have versions of this where it looks like just a mountain so, or a volcano, so it's just one half. And I debated. I actually sent it to some of my friends that I've met along the way in physics and engineering. And I said, what do you, what do you see? But I couldn't get past this section right here because I was thinking about like the Big Bang. I was like, how do I describe this thing that has a source point and moves out. So I couldn't leave this little moment. So I kind of just kept going back to this version of the piece. And I also found myself wanting to talk about the space that I had seen, the Sanford lab. And I was trying to find ways to connect it to Homestake, this history, which is interesting and the, you know, rich, pun intended here. But a 1933 drawing of one of the head frames grabbed my attention. And I was like, huh, what can I do with that? So this is on like a, a fine art paper that's uh, kind of a soft print with a deckled edge actually. So this, this is the digital file. But I was interested in this idea of an arrow. So arrows have been in my work previously. And as I kept thinking about this search for things that happens at the lab, I thought about this idea of going underground. So I wanted that movement of that arrow to move your eye down. So I wanted a longer piece. And then there was the weird spaghetti bacteria, which I don't know what else to call it other than spaghetti or hair bacteria. And I was fascinated by it. And I wanted the gold to come out. So I was looking at color. So hints of gold. I also wanted more of this little twisty kind of thing right there. I mean, I was trying to be very intentional about where your eye went, what happened, the, the abstractness of the things I was reading coming through. And then there was sort of a dreamy quality to it all. I found being there dreamy. And I'm a professor. I'm used to seeing things that are that my students produce that make me feel awe. I mean, you know, I, I watch them go from, you know, ticking away on the computer to suddenly making something amazing and I just get to have this moment with them. So it was kind of like that, but big, way bigger in some ways. So I was kind of in awe of the place and these people and being inspired. So I wanted to make a piece that was just sort of pleasant. <sighs> these pieces were hard to do. So the reason I'm saying this is because I've painted many, many, many gold pans and many, many, many kinds of spray paint with many, many errors. So I'm sure my neighbors were just like, what is going on? What is she doing in the backyard? Why is she spraying all these things gold? So multiple versions of this piece. Some had dripping because I wasn't patient enough with it. I wasn't patient enough. 
So I had to slow down and spray slowly and build up slowly. And I had to change paints. I learned that this plastic um, uh, material that these gold pans, just in case you don't know what they are, they are gold pans, um, kind of commercial level for fun, go out and get to gold pan. Um, so these gold pans, and then inside of them, I was very mindful about not using actual rock from the area, but using scans and things because the connection of the Native Americans and the, the uh, commitment the lab has to not removing the ore and the rock. So this is actually a slice that you can see. And then this is a Google image of lead. So I wanted there to be this connection between what was inside the earth that we couldn't see easily and then what you could see with a bird's eye view. So I kept thinking about the vastness. How do you say big and little at the same time? How do you talk about bacteria and the Big Bang at the same time? Because in many ways, the fascination with the small and the big are the same thing for me. And that is a core sample, just in case I didn't say. And the latter. Now, the latter has personal significance for me. And sometimes you'll catch me talking about it in a talk, and sometimes you won't. But my mother passed away when I was in my late 20s, and I started using the ladder as a symbol for that connection, like trying to reach her, so the idea of the heavens. So whenever I see a ladder, it's kind of this nod that I'm making to my mother, so I try to include them in my artwork. So when I'm doing that, those of you who know me, and now people know me, um, you'll know that that's what I'm, I'm kind of making a nod to. So when you're looking at artwork, the artist may be carrying all kinds of things into that work things that are personal, things that they don't tell you, things that are secrets for just them. And then I wanted to use the head frame as well, because again, I was looking at this symbol of a place. There is a head frame there, the projector might make it difficult to see a little bit. These are brake shoes, so the elevator systems that are at the Sanford lab and we're at Homestake, the head frames house a pulley system, which allows these elevators to go up and down. Brilliant tech actually, and it still works after 100 plus years. So I managed to get a hold, thanks to the lab, um, some of the brake shoes used in one of the older, smaller elevator systems. And I decided to use those as shelving for objects or things that I thought were important. So in my previous work, I had used shelves, windows, all kinds of things to try to frame or give, make something important. So when you put something on a shelf, it's important, right? So I was trying to say, here's this important thing. So why a golden donkey? So when I was reading about homesteak, I was sort of uh, tickled, I, you know, to use the term, but I thought it was very amusing that they had brought this horse or donkey above ground in like to give it a parade. So it had been born underground, it was brought above ground. And, and if, you know, that may be in some ways, according to our thinking, this is early to mid 1900s, might be like, oh, that's kind of cruel. But I was sort of amazed by this idea and all these pictures of people celebrating this creature. So I thought, man, I've got to put a golden donkey somewhere. Golden, and of course, I was spray painting that in my yard to the amusement of my neighbors as well. And you'll see that I put the copper rings inside of the head frame here, merging some of these ideas. Another shelf. I love jars, containers. They're everywhere. I collect them. Big ones, little ones. Growlers, I mean, almost anything that'll hold something, I'm fascinated by. I like the utility of it. I like the history of it in some cases. So here is a level I managed to get a hold of as well. The lab was nice enough to, to let me rummage a little. And I, I, have, I was just like, look at that. Look at that thing, it's beautiful. This little tiny thing that was used for a purpose. And then there was copper, which I kept bringing back, the copper just, pulled me in. 
And then a metal little ball that was used her, during home stake that I picked up at the mining museum in Leed. Um, so it was used to help crush the ore. This is a failed piece. Sometimes I show you a failed piece because the failed piece was necessary for me to get to the one that didn't fail. So you might say, well, why is it failed? It just didn't do it for me. So I probably won't put it in a show. I might talk about it with my students so I can say, see, I told you I make 100 terrible things in order to get two good ones, which is almost pretty accurate. Um, I was trying to do too many things with this. So there is a history of collage. I'm interested in collage. I tend to work in digital collage and not physical collage when, in this style. But I wanted to bring in, you'll see, because you know me now, ladders, gold pans. I thought the little danger magnet was kind of interesting. It says, do not touch. And it's something like, um, not only will this hurt, not only will this kill you, but it'll hurt the whole time you're dying, which is kind of tongue in cheek, but it's like, oh boy. Um, so I found that sort of like the, the visceral nature of the things that I was reading about homesteak. So I also wanted to go back to this idea of blueprints and drawings, things that have to come before the things are built, which I find interesting. There's a little cicada here. Another throwback to my childhood. My mother and I always looked for cicada shells. I think cicadas are interesting. They're that loud bug that makes that, you know? So when you're hiking and you know it's hot and then it gets hotter and there's more, well, I love them. I'm even wearing them on my ears right now. So I really wanted to put a cicada into the artwork, but it didn't quite work. Part of the reason I like a cicada, and many of you probably know this, they lay dormant underground for a period. I thought, what a cool idea to use this creature that goes underground and then has to come above ground as part of my symbol set for the Sanford Lab. And maybe by the time I have my full art show, this will be resolved and you'll say, ah, oh, she figured out how to put a cicada in there. Now, the reason I'm here, there's a puzzle piece. I picked up a puzzle from the visitor center in Leed, the Sanford Homestead Visitor Center. And it was a puzzle with Ray Davis. So if you don't know who Ray Davis was, in the 1960s, he was a physicist that went underground with the Homestake Mine Company, and he was looking for neutrinos or researching neutrinos. So if you don't know the history, it's wonderful to read. So he's, to me, a part of the bigger puzzle. To me, he's a part of this, this narrative of a place and by looking at Ray Davis, I finally realized I just needed the puzzle piece with him in it. So I used this puzzle piece and it's enlarged to about 10 inches wide. And he is the only focus. It doesn't get lost then in all this. I realized what I was trying to go for and all I needed to do was say one thing with the piece. He was a part of the puzzle. This piece fell apart when I was trying to install it because I dropped it. Now, I know, I'm getting, you're finding out all kinds of secrets tonight. Now, the reason I say that is because there are artists out there who think all of this is going smoothly. It is not. I have plenty of things that I literally try not to cuss out loud so people don't know how frustrated I am. I just go, oh, gee, I gotta take that back to the studio. Gotta put that back together. I have a lot of those moments. So I went and spray painted again in my backyard this antler so that it was gold and copper because I was trying to combine the two. And then I found these really wonderful, you know, old gauges at the lab, as well as some wood pieces that they were nice enough to give me to use when I started making really specific requests about pieces I was trying to build. I'm like, I have this idea. Um, and I found it was very collaborative as I was talking to people. And when you say you have an idea and you say, can I please just pick up this weird old rubber tire gasket thing? And they were like, you really wanna pick that up? And I'm like, yes, I do. Because I kept seeing circles. And I loved my bacteria and they needed to be framed. So ended up with another piece that was an accident that turned out better than I expected. So I worked with Simpsons Printing, wonderful local here in, um, in Rapid City. They were delightful to work with, and 
I was experimenting. I'd say, what happens if we print it clear in the background? What happens if we have white behind it and not white? What happens? And they were just as excited to try things as I was. And this bacteria, which I didn't mean to request the way I did, I thought it would be white and it was see-through. And I was laying in bed frustrated because I only had a few days to pull this piece together before I was gonna have it um, ready for a website. And then it hit me, what if I put a white piece of paper behind it? And then it hit me further. And I think even a friend had mentioned it and it just flew by me. Sometimes that happens. If I'm, if I'm in frustrated artist mode, I'm just like, nothing's working. So I was laying there and I thought, what if I put one of those drawings behind it from Homestake or, you know, so I just got very excited and it pulled it together. So I was combining all these things, literally layering them. This is the first piece that I think came together that I went, okay, I'm going in a direction because there's always a point where I think I can't do it. There's always a point where I think I'm going to fail and then I question everything. I question like, what, I'm an artist? You know, so I question everything. Now, I don't know an artist who fully feels like they're always on it. And I'm betting everybody feels that way in whatever field they're in, that you have these moments of doubt. And as long as you keep going, which I found to be the key, in my case, I just had to keep messing with these copper rings that I had scanned and layering them and layering them and layering them. So I remember calling Simpsons or actually going in and saying, can we print on metal? They're like, heck yeah, I could print on metal. And they did. And we tried different things where different sheens and being able to see through and not being able to see through. And I ended up with these pieces that are about 22 by 30 each inches, 22 by 30 inches each. And I, I'm, I'm happy with them. And they did that thing that I was looking for. They shined, they had silver, they had gold, they had copper. And I kept going back to the, this idea of the cosmos and things kept getting dreamy and I threw bacteria in there because I was just interested in all these layers. And a friend loaned me a burst disc, again, something I didn't know what it was. It was this tiny thing, a little smaller than the photo multiplier tube that was just sort of, it looked like it had been popped because it had, it was a burst disc. And I scanned that, I scanned the bottom of it, the top of it. And then I ended up bringing that in and manipulating that. And then I thought, man, I wanna print this thing on metal. This thing will be cool on metal. So I started trying more and more with the materials I was printing on. I found it interesting to print on both acrylic, this kind of plasticky stuff. So imagine a movie poster except printed on like, so you've got this plastic in the front and you could see through. And I also printed on metal and I was trying all these things and it took me a really long time to get here. It took me a long time to cut these shapes out. This was a single piece and it just wasn't coming together. And I was working with Hubble images, which that is what this is. And I was working with these bacteria and it was just one single square image. And I hadn't duplicated things and tried to have a rhythm that echoed out. When I kept thinking about like this idea of echo and sound and we're seeing things, we're seeing stars that have been dead long ago kind of thing. It's like what does all this mean? Nothing will make you question things like being an artist or a physicist, I think, from what I can tell after talking to everybody. And then this piece, and it might be a little hard to see, this piece is one that, again, was hard to come by. Like it was multiple versions. It was something I thought was going to fail. So those cable slices, you might remember them, in the bucket that I was so thrilled over. At first, I ended up with a large square or rectangular piece that sort of looked like, um, like a church window. Like it wasn't, it, it was like it had something and I kept going, does it have it? And then I had the realization because I've used my hand in several bodies of work for over, gosh, 13 years now. Um, I realized that I wanted to somehow speak to the humanity of things. Now, I made this piece after COVID. And I think part of the, the pull toward the hand was the fact that we couldn't touch. It was sort of this lack of touch. 
this disconnect that made me want to represent something that was connected. And people have been putting hands on for cave drawings and everything. There's a history of man and, well, woman wanting to leave their mark. And that's what I was doing here. And this piece is four feet wide at the largest, which I think takes up a nice amount of space. And I've done smaller versions. I'm sure, you know, if anybody needs a four foot hand in their house, I can provide such a thing. And I have a website, seekingtheunseen.com, where you can see more of the artwork. And I do want to thank just a few people um, or entities. Uh, the Sanford Lab uh, was just and is still uh, remarkable. And I have to say thank you to Black Hill State, who's always supported me. I've been at Black Hill State since uh, 2008. And there are many others that I'd like to thank, but South Dakota School of Mines, I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Are there any questions? Um, then just real quick, uh, thank you again thank for you. that very interesting talk. That was that was great, thank actually. You. Um, as I said earlier, our STEAM Cafe talks are the third Tuesday of every month. So our next one will be on February 16th. And it's going to be Unexpected Wonders from the Vast Unknown, Images from the Hubble Space Telescope. And it will be presented by Tom Durkin, who's the Deputy Director of the South Dakota Space Grant Consortium on our campus. So. Um, again, thank you, thank you. Gina, for coming. Thank you very and, much. Um, thank you all for joining us.